Major funding for these broadcasts is made possible by grants from Chase Commercial Term Lending and New York Community Bank, MNT Bank, Perfect Building Maintenance, Capital One Bank, The Wickhoff Group, Genova Burns, Gene Tomasi, Webster, Greenberg Trorick. Additional funding is provided by grants from AKA Hotels, Corman Communities, Aerial Property Advisors, AVR Realty Company, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Bank Leumi USA, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Citizens Bank, Colliers International NYC, CPEX Real Estate Services, Cushman and Wakefield, Customers Bank, DDG, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, Fisher Brothers, First Nationwide Title Agency, Flushing Bank, Foley and Lardner, Friedman LLP, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, HAP Investment Developers, Herrick Feinstein, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, James Orfanides, Chairman US Realty.com, John Katsimides, Red Apple Group, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knuckle Realty Services, Matone Group, Mercantile Commerce Bank, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Grub Knight Frank, New Banks, MHP Real Estate Services, People's United Bank, SJP Properties, Sterling National Bank, Sterling Risk, Stonehenge Partners, TD Bank, Terra CRG, The Continuum Company, CUNY TV Foundation, The Moynian Group, Urban American, and These Friends. So Sicily, Brooklyn, New York, Halsey Street, Metropolitan Avenue, you know, track and field at Lafayette, going to uh, NYU, Columbia, PhD, Board of Education, the White House, Public Affairs. I have the man who is the king of public affairs. The legendary of you, Steve Aiello. Thanks for being here today. My pleasure, Michael. Thank you. So let's go back to the paternal grandparents. Tell me about Mama's side and Pop's side. Well, they both came here from uh, Sicily. And in fact, both my grandmother and grandpa were from the same town, from Partanna. Grandma Maria and Grandpa Stefano were brother and sister, which means that... Uh, my brother and I are children of first cousins, which explains a great many things. We have those wonderful pictures of, you, you know, you, your father, your, your mother coming over. She was a beautiful woman, your mother over here. She was. Now, you said to me they came over Halsey Street. Tell me about the Halsey Street. Sure. Well, mom, mom and uh, my maternal uh, folks actually went to Metropolitan Avenue first. Halsey Street was where dad and my aunts and my namesake, uh, Stefano, first made their homes uh, when they came from Italy. And this was the typical immigrant story. When you were born, where'd you grow up? Uh, well, we grew up in Brooklyn and then we moved uh, into Bensonhurst, Brooklyn. Um, your dad would be uh, a character, we would say, a very interesting character who played the alto sax. He played sax, he played alto, he played soprano, he played clarinet, uh, he played the spoons, which he played at family gatherings and stuff. He sang, uh, and he, he played in the George White scandals. One of the places where he played is he played in Chicago. Yes, he He played did. at the speakeasies, you know, the Capone story. Why don't you tell the story about he used to play and then they used to drive him home to the roomy house. What was the story? Well, because uh, that's how he came home and he met Mama. That's how he met Mama. That's how he started to play that's George right. White and, scandals. Right, and you wouldn't have been here because if this didn't happen. It, so what was it, the story? Pop would be driven home to the boarding house where he stayed most nights uh, by some of the fellows who ran the speakeasies there. And one night he was told by a fellow he knew well, Bill, no, you usually sit in the front, sit in the back. Uh, sit in the back and why don't you go to sleep? And the way Pop told the story was that uh, these fellas had found someone who they thought 
had uh, ratted on some of their friends. And so they uh, made sure that he wouldn't rat again. My father knew what happened, took off the next day, left Chicago, and said he could not deal with that kind of thing. Now, how did your father you, you, meet your mother? He, because that was a short romance. Your father was, uh, you know, he made decisions quickly. Well, remember, he got married very late in life. He was 39. He was 39. He was basically on his own since he was 11 or 12. They were cousins, and at that time, which was basically true for a number of immigrant families, but Italian-Americans, they met through the families. So his aunts were also aunts to my mother, and they introduced my mother to my father, uh, knowing that mom wanted to be married at some point in her life, and they thought that at 29 had roamed around enough, and here was a wonderful person. She was beautiful, she was smart, she was uh, a member of the family already, uh, and so they introduced them. But when Pop was smitten by her immediately, for all those reasons, and our aunts said to her, he's wonderful, we raised him after his mother died, but I don't know really if this is the right thing for you to do because he's set in his ways. And it was the right thing. They were together for close to 50 years. So when Pop comes back, how's he get in, he gets into the paint business originally? He, well, he worked a little construction. He was still playing saxophone. And he t uh, took some courses in learning how to do dyes for books. If At that time, the covers of books were done manually with dyes. And he started to get into the book business through that. And eventually, some work with Gallier and some other things. Yes, yes. Eventually, uh, he started his own company, WA Book Service, which existed for 55 years. Which was on Hudson Street, which was, which was a place that you worked at. So let's talk about you growing up. You were born when the family lived in Bensonhurst, right? Now. Right. Where did you go to public school originally? Went to PS 97, which was right across the street from the apartment where we lived at one point. Convenient. A very convenient. Went there. And we were always pushed, Mike, if I, if I say this, from the time I remember, education was one of the most important things in our lives because that's what my mother and father pushed. Said, you're living in the best country in the world and you don't know it yet, but take advantage of education because that's the differentiator. They may not have said differentiator, but that's what they meant. So then you went to Booty. Went to Booty Junior High School. And then you went to the rival, I went to Lincoln, you and the rival Bob New Utrecht, you went to Lafayette. I went to Lafayette. Great place, good school, some good baseball players. Yeah, there's kids, Sandy yeah, Koufax. Koufax, right? you know, pitching, you know, yeah, yeah, and, right. you know, and Wilpon, you know, he then decided that, you know, if I can't play baseball full time, I'll buy a team. Right. So you're, you're, you're in Lafayette, and you ran track and field, you said. I ran track and field and played football, and I, I was always very fast. Uh, fast forward, uh, I became captain of the track team, and I was the Division I 100-yard dash champion. I ran the 109 nine, uh, 9 .9 seconds. Now, you also were in the music. I began playing saxophone uh, when I was six years old. Uh, Pop had played saxophone, and so I got into music then. And I carried it all the way through for right. years. You know, you know, growing up, you know, the, since we we're relatively contemporaries, you know, there was the business. There was the Leonard's. There was the Huntington Townhouse. There was the Imperial Manor. Okay, did you also go up to the Bronx? Did you, uh, Marino's on the Bay? I, on the Bay, I played there a few times, but I played, I think, in over 80% of the catering halls in the city of New York and Long Island. There was a time when you we could were have been, the house you know, band. The, the, you could have been the house band, Stephen Scott Orchestras. <laughs> but it was a way for you that later on in life helped you supplement your income when you became a school teacher. Abs absolutely so. So you go to NYU uh, because you're, you have a full scholarship to NYU. So talk to me about the days at NYU and how you then decided to become a teacher. Well, NYU was a wonderful experience. Remember a, a kid from Brooklyn, from Bensonhurst, now suddenly his NYU, Greenwich Village during the 60s, the social revolution happening, all of this was taking place and it was new to me to a great extent. Uh, and I made some lifelong friends at NYU also. Uh, some great teachers, uh, some great colleagues who were friends. I, I got very interested in government. I became secretary of the senior class. And lo and behold, against a few people's thoughts, I made the dean's list again and, uh, See, and was a scholar Some there. people could have been the other side of the dean's list. <laughs> right. So you graduate NYU, and you then get to work at Lincoln High School. 
Well, I, I do. I went first full time for my master's at Columbia. Uh, I thought I was going to go to law school, but I really wasn't that interested. I was interested in teaching, and some great teachers, going back to Lafayette and going back to Booty all the way through, had inspired me. And I thought I wanted to be a professor right away. Uh, it was a rude awakening when uh, I was going for my PhD and there weren't any positions. But I, I started to teach at Lincoln High School. I was a student teacher first and then was very fortunate to become a permanent sub and then was permanently going to be appointed there when I shocked the principal, soul rest in peace, Abraham Lass, who was an icon in the school system, and said I really was going to switch to another school because Lincoln could do well without any great teachers because of the kids, the parents, the motivations. But I wanted to go to a school where blacks and Italians were at each other's throats. It was a relatively new school, two years old, Franklin D. Roosevelt High School. And I was there for two years. So how do you get to the Board of Education? Well, from Franklin D. Roosevelt, I was one of 30% of new teachers chosen by the principal, Joshua Siegel, to go to John Dewey High School, which was an experimental school. Uh, and I became head of student activities there, plus teaching. During that time, I wrote an article for the American Historical Review as a freshman writer on cultural pluralism, which came to the attention of then a board member, Dr. Seymour Lackman, who I know you know, Mike. Uh, and Seymour asked to see me, uh, and the rest is history. I became an assistant to Seymour when he was president of the board. Then I succeeded him. I became president, the only person re-elected president twice, and it was an incredible experience. So how does the kid from Bensonhurst, now at the Board of Education, end up in Washington? Well, a few things. Uh, Abe Beam was one of the first mayors who endorsed then Governor Jimmy Carter for president. And I became involved in the Carter campaign for president and stayed in touch with Hamilton Jordan and Jack Watson from the Carter administration and particularly Walter Mondale. Two years into that, uh, they were looking to create a position that would be a liaison with the so-called white ethnic community. They had special assistance for African American, Hispanic, Middle East Jewish community, but not the large 125 million white ethnics. And I was privileged to be chosen to take that position based on a lot of work I had done in New York City, both with the board and not-for-profits in the diversity that is right, New now York. Right. You did a lot of diversity. I mean, you were involved uh, going back to the Columbus Club, but also to the Italian associations. Right. What was your initial involvement over there? Well, the, the Columbus Club came through the Pope's Fortune Pope and basically yeah. scholarship education. My involvement with the Italian American Civil Rights League came through a lot of community work that I had done and then being made aware of uh, what was going on. I wasn't a believer because of my own history that much that there was really discrimination and stereotyping and prejudice against Italian Americans. But the more I became aware of that, and the more I tried to discuss that with uh, friends of mine who thought I was great when I was a liberal and civil rights and fighting for everyone else, uh, and then thought, well, what, what is he talking about? And so, so you leave the board, you go to the White House, you're there for what, 18 months? Or? Eight, 18 months and physically at the White House uh, a little over a year. So now what happens? And now, now what happens is uh, 44 million Americans said that, that we should be leaving Washington. I was honored to uh, play a minor role with the transition team with the Reagan people uh, and just pushing that. I hope the office we had started and I thought a lot of the good work we had done in multicultural and bringing people together would continue. Uh, I had met a lot of people, obviously. I had traveled to 20 states. There were a number of conferences that my office had at the White House. And I was, uh, I had met Harold Burson, who was head of Burson Marstella at the time. And we talked about me coming over to Burson Marstella. They were building their public affairs capability in New York and the East Coast. And I thought that that was a great opportunity. And you're ready to go there, and then you get a phone call from your buddy Ed Koch, right? Yes, I do. And what does Ed say to you? And Ed says that uh, he would like me to take the presidency of the Educational Construction Fund. Uh, why? Because they were transitioning it into a much larger group, and he felt I had the background, the experience, he could trust me. And I, I thanked him and said, I 
really, really don't want to do it, Ed. I'll be as helpful as I can, but I have this wonderful opportunity. And Ed, in his own way, and you knew Ed very well, in his own way said, one of the reasons you have that wonderful opportunity is your access to me. And I know Harold very well. Come over for a year. So what do you do for that one year at the education? Because that's when they started building more schools. And that well, the, the uh, ECF, the Educational Construction Fund, had been around for a number of years. And it had built a number of schools in conjunction with private industry. It was leasing city property uh, to corporations like AT&T, uh, like Colgate-Palmolive, like others, and they would build schools also, take the air rights from there and enter into a 99-year lease. But there, the idea of making this even bigger and broader had been on the table for a while. And during that year, one of the things I did was to become involved in cr helping to create what became the School Construction Authority, the New York City School Construction Authority, and one or two other projects that I'm fairly proud of. We built schools in conjunction with private industry. Where? Uh, 34th Street, the uh, Murray Bertram School. Right, which is a very interesting because it was a true, you know, that was also on the, uh, the former location of an armory. That's right. Right. We, we had that. Uh, we built 34 different projects uh, over the years when I was president of the board and then president of ECF. With ECF, I think we had three projects in the year I was there. So you leave and you go now to... Burson Marstella. It was this medication, it was the question of the tainted Tylenol, right? Yes. So tell me about the tainted Tylenol. Almost the very first assignment I got to work on was the Tylenol crisis and the Tylenol issue. And uh, at, at that time, if you recall, seven people had died because of the poisoning of, of that capsule. But I got to work with a great team, both internally and externally, at the, the both Tylenol crises. And that has kept me in very, very good stead going back because it was the gold standard of crisis management at that point in time. So from Burston, how do you get involved with Hill and Knowlton? Well, there was an in-between of about 10 years. Uh, we had bought a company called Conan Wolf, uh, which we wanted to have a, a southeastern, southern uh, capability. And we were looking at sports marketing. And I was part of the team that had talked about purchasing and acquiring. Sports Coma. marketing because of your track and field days? Uh, sports and, and your tennis. Which and, and we, we have to talk about We have to tennis talk about right. tennis, but more so because we were expanding our capabilities. And I was asked to join Conan Wolf, the company that we acquired, first as the head of the New York office, remaining on the Burson Marstella Board of Directors for Public Affairs. And then I had the honor of being president and CEO for 10 years during one of the greatest growth periods for a public relations, public affairs firm. So what are the public uh, major events that you took care of? I know recently you've been involved with a major event with AIG, but we'll right. talk about that later, but during the, the days of the other companies. Well, we were, Conan Wolf uh, itself, when I became president, uh, was the number one sports marketing, sports publicity firm in our industry itself. And we became involved in almost all of the Olympics, the Summer Olympics, when, uh, on behalf of clients. Uh, we became involved in Hands Across America for Coca-Cola. We did the Olympic Torch Relay, the first privately funded uh, 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 Olympic Games in the history of the United States. We did numbers of those kinds of things. We did USA for Africa. And for clients, various clients, we do major events. One that I, I'm still smiling as I think about it, for Colgate Palmolive, we did a national contest on America's Funniest Dentist as we were introducing a new product. We introduced the new BMW Z3 with the James Bond film. We did and worked with the Reebok Human Rights and the uh, Federation and Foundation, as well as that time in the Olympics, if you remember, Dan and Dave, the Dan and Dave campaign. Numbers of projects for numbers of clients like that, major projects, but my specialty individually was essentially public affairs and crisis management, where some of the crises you don't know about because they never became That's right, crises. Because uh, the true specialist in the crisis management is to get rid of the crisis before it uh, before it actually happens. before it hits and it, it's amazing today because of what technology has done and the 24 7 news cycle and the instantaneous uh 
just proliferation of stories and news and blogs and going viral. And it's a different way that you have to look at approaching crisis management, but the principles remain the same. You know, the, the group of people that you met over the years, tennis group, tell me the story of how that happened and some of the guys who were part of it, because many of them are great community leaders and business people. A absolutely. It actually had its origin at the tennis tournament that the city council was running uh, with Sid Davidoff and Tony Glideman and Dave Dinkins and Peter Vallone. And a number of us knew each other from that, from government, from uh, business. And we decided 30 years ago next year that we enjoy this, we enjoy the people, let's go away. So 30 years ago we started the New York VIPs and we did not name ourselves that. At the very first outing in uh, Palmaire in Florida, they had put a hospitality room aside for us and they called us the New York VIPs and that stuck with us. Sid Davidoff, as I just mentioned, Mayor Dinkins w was part of that, Tony Glideman was part of it, Peter Vallone was, was part of it. Uh, uh, names that the public would Sounds know. Sounds like a Republican... Uh... <laughs> no, we actually balanced it. We had, oh, you we did? Had, you, you, we actually you, okay. balanced it. We did had did some you have any conservatives over there? In the... I, I, I think we, we must have because the discussions, especially the political discussions, could get very heated. And uh, some of our best friends, we were bipartisan, maybe even tripartisan. But it's, it's been an incredible group uh, of people. We've made lifelong friends. Let's talk about C C C CCS. Is it? CSS. CSS. Tell me how you got involved with CSS. Uh, David Jones, who has been the president CEO for over 25 years at this point, was also the director of the New York City Youth Board. And I was named by Mayor Koch to the Youth Board, eventually became chairman of the Youth Board. And when CSS named David, uh, as their CEO, he recruited some of us, asked us to think about going on to the board. And I did, I became chairman, eventually I was chairman twice, and then I had one of the great honors of my life. I was named the lifetime trustee of CSS a number of years ago. What about, you know, the Italian associations and really the Columbus Club and the involvement over there that you've had over the years? Essentially over the years, the, the involvement has been in one of the primary uh, goals and objectives of the Columbus Citizens Club and that is education and it's education not only to preserve and protect and foster Italian American history and culture in an ecumenical way not to the exclusion of others but also to take a look at students who are academically very proficient but do not have the financial wherewithal and so we began scholarship programs. Right, the adopt a stu uh, student program. Right, that, that started years ago and, and a former President Frank Facero and current President Angelo Vivolo very much on, uh, have made that a continuing priority. And I got involved also in, in some of the marketing and communications as would almost be a natural. Uh, and we, I think, have brought the Columbus Citizens Club uh, as a leader into the 21st century using technology as a not-for-profit organization. Speaking of not-for-profits, you recently, and we have a picture of you and Bill de Blasio, You've recently been appointed uh, on the board of Jazz for Lincoln Center? I'm the uh, mayoral appointment to the board of governors, the sole appointment of the mayor. I'm thrilled as we've talked I about, mean, look, Mike. Look, you pop, you know, <laughs> doing an alto sax, yourself being a musician. Uh, and, it's and, like a kid getting into, you know, Into candy. the candy store. And I've been a patron and a uh, supporter of Jazz at Lincoln Center since its inception. I'm very excited about it. And I'm excited also to link it into the programs it already has with the Department of Education for education and community-based programs and getting younger people more involved and appreciative of jazz, which is our only indigenous American cultural phenomenon. We have a picture of you and your brother. What's your brother do today? Nicky is an associate professor at Turo College. He had been a, a professor and a deputy at the Board of Education in curriculum and personnel for years. He has his PhD in English from Fordham. Uh, and uh, he was going to retire, but the opportunity of continuing to help people and help students. Let's talk about uh, your family, your love of your life and the, and the daughters and your grandchild. Uh, well, you just mentioned my grandchild. It just makes me smile just thinking about my Corinne Elizabeth. I, I didn't know I could love 
people more than I love my daughters. Uh, I have three wonderful girls. Uh, Tina, who's Corinne's mother, is an attorney. Laura is right now with Corn Ferry and is a terrific writer. And Marie just finished her master's in uh, uh, pre-K and special ed. Uh, and my wife is president, CEO of the School Construction Authority. I think I remember <laughs> about 15 minutes ago, you told me you were involved with this group. That's a small world. It's a very small world. I'm very, very proud of all of them. And I have to say, I'm particularly proud of my wife, Lorraine, who has been recognized by the industry and so many others as such a dominant force and such an effective leader. But that, to me, is the most important thing in the world, a family and the fellas and gals that I call friends who are part of my family, Sid, Ray Ferrier, Steve Krause, Scott Mullen, uh, Joe Harbert, who you spoke with, uh, Nick uh, Gravanti, so, uh, so many people. But that, to me, that's what we learned from my parents now, now also. You, you see, what could have happened is, you know, you could have been on the gigs, you know, with the Stephen Scott Orchestra or the Hank Lane Orchestra playing over here, right. but you're not playing the saxophone, but you're, you're doing even better. You're, you're taking care of the community, and uh, you, you've worked hard. And, you know, I, I always love telling stories about people who grew up in Brooklyn because they're the, the greatest story around. Um, weren't you also involved with the City University? Uh, and, and have been involved. When I was president of the Board of Ed, we set up a liaison with CUNY, and I've maintained that uh, through the chancellorship of, of Matt Goldstein, uh, and involved now with, with City, uh, and hopefully the involvement will become even greater. So, even though the tennis game is not that good these days because of certain injuries, you're still out there, you keep in touch with the tennis guys, you have a wonderful family, and you know what? It's been a great honor to have you today. Oh, it's been my pleasure. Thank you, Michael.